Hi guys, it's Steffi from The Novelty Corner and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm here with my Books Beside My Bed video. For those of you who are new to my channel, I film one of these every week and I upload it on Monday Australian time and I share with you the books that I've read in the last seven days. For those of you who are very familiar with these videos, welcome back. Because this is basically the last wrap up of March, I do have my stats ready to go at the end of this video. So at the end of every month, I sort of update you guys on what some of my reading stats are just so you can see how it changes over the course of the year. There is one more day of March left, but I will count that into April's wrap up just because otherwise you'd have to wait another week for the stats and they'll be skewed quite heavily by April's reading anyway. I'm sorry if my voice sounds really weird because I was out at a friend's engagement last night and was singing, so I seem to have done something to my voice. This is my reading wrap up from the 24th until the 30th of March. I read five books this week. Three of those were middle grade books, one was a young adult and one was an adult review copy. I read a total of 1915 pages and my yearly reading total is up to 78 books. I am currently reading The Orchardist's Daughter by Karen Biggers. This was a review copy sent to me from Alan and Unwin. I am reading this for the Owls Readathon. This is part of my Charms exam and last year I did complete the Charms mini readathon so I got to start this book early and it's going really well so far. It is a contemporary book set in Tasmania and written by an Australian author which is important because I have found out just yesterday that two booktubers who are brand new to me are hosting something called Aussie April or hashtag Aussie April. Those two booktubers are Doris and Jacqueline. I will leave, li I will leave links to them down below but they are encouraging people to try and read Australian authors in April. Obviously being Australian, I love Australian authors. We have such a wonderful plethora of them and they're amazing. If you guys would like me to do any Aussie author recommendations, do let me know in the comments and I'm happy to film something like that in April. I have talked a lot about Aussie authors though in the past, so feel free to go through my back catalogue of videos. You'll find something somewhere. And I will also mention that I have updated my Aussie booktubers list on my blog. I will leave a link to that down below. So if you're looking for other Aussie booktubers or you are an Aussie book booktuber and I don't have you on that list, let me know because I will add you. Okay, I'm going to jump into the reviews. The first review is for Middle Game by Sean and Maguire, which is a 2019 release from Tor. I received this as a review copy from NetGalley and to be perfectly honest, I'm completely on the fence about how to review this book because I did really enjoy it, but I also contemplated many, many times throughout the reading of it, DNFing it because it just took so long for things to happen. Really cool concept, just slow. And it sort of started to drive me a little bit crazy. So I don't think, I haven't rated it on Goodreads and I haven't even written my review for it yet because I am, it's been seven days since I finished it and I'm still conflicted. Essentially, it is the story of a brother and sister who have been genetically created by essentially Frankenstein's monster and or an archetype to Frankenstein's monster. And this surrogate father is trying to turn these two children into gods. They're not the only set of twins that he has uh, been involved in creating. There are other sets and they're all experiments. And so all of the different experimental kids get put into different situations to see how they will turn out essentially. And so these two twins, Roger and Dodger, because he likes, he likes rhyming names, are sent out into the world. So one is raised by a family that he has handpicked and is aware of their status. And the other is raised by a family who has no concepts. She's adopted out and her family know nothing about how she was created or what her potential is. This book follows Roger and Dodger over the entire course of their lives from the time when they were very, very young, all the way they're into sort of their adulthood and early middle age. What they discover is that they constantly cross paths and they have the ability to communicate with each other over long distances. They constantly have falling outs and then move apart from one another and then find themselves gravitating back towards one another as they sort of move towards this inherent power that they have. And there are other side characters, who, um, one in particular Erin, who I really loved. Erin was fantastic. She was a really kick-ass female character and she just meddles and interferes and also guides in a way that shows that she has an innate understanding of what their creator is trying to do and she doesn't always agree with that. It is very science slash magic heavy. It deals with alchemy and like I said, I really enjoyed the concept. It just took a really long time, particularly as Roger and Dodger constantly have falling outs and move apart and then you have to rebuild again. 
And if you're someone who doesn't like timeline jumps and timeline shifts, be aware of that going in. That stuff I loved, that I found really cool, but it does constantly reset the story. So you have to be aware of that going in. Ultimately, if I had to give it a rating, I would probably sit around three because it was good. But I think this is probably a book I should have known more about going into it. Then I read The Hollow Boy by Jonathan Stroud. This is book three in the Lockwood and Co series. And this is probably so far not my favorite of the series, although I did give it five out of five because of reasons and I'll talk about that in a minute. It was published in 2015 by Corgi. I gave it five out of five stars, mostly because it scared the crap out of me. I mean, I'm not all that difficult to scare, but this one I had to sleep with the light on afterwards because it was just slightly terrifying for me. So this follows Lockwood, Lucy and George. They are beginning to gain in popularity and repute in their city and as such they're finding themselves with more jobs and they're having to manage a whole lot more than they were previously used to. George and Lockwood decide to hire an assistant Holly. This causes some problems with Lucy because Lucy and Holly don't see eye to eye straight away, particularly since Lucy was not involved in the process. We begin to see that these characters really are individuals in this book and you get to see that, you know, they don't always get along and that they struggle with getting along and they struggle with working with one another. And that was really important for this story. And Lucy in particular begins to understand that perhaps what she's doing and her abilities need to be explored a lot more. And this doesn't always sit right with everyone else. This was really good fun. It was really creepy. The entire scene, like climax scene takes place in a derelict shopping center, which is terrifying let me just say, and had some really creepy paranormal ghost things going on, more so than other books. Other books, I the other books I handled relatively well, but this one, there's just one particular thing that creeped me out to no end. But I do highly recommend this series. It is really good fun. I do have books four and five. I'm holding onto them for Tome Topple in April because Tome Topple's on as well in April and they're over 500 pages, so I will hopefully get to them then. Then I read Arusha and the End of Time by Roshani Chakshi. This is one of the Rick Riordan Presents books, Hindu mythology. Arusha is just an ordinary girl whose mother is an archeologist and basically owns a museum. And so Aru lives at this museum. And one day while trying to impress some friends, she unwittingly unleashes creature demon that is going to end the world. And it's up to her and the descendants of a line of warriors to stop this god of destruction from wreaking havoc on the world. Aru is just, she's just a normal girl. She's in middle school and she is trying to make her way in a world that she knows that she's different in. I would have liked to have seen the mythology unpacked a little bit more. It felt very surface level and maybe hopefully in future books it will be because it was very interesting and it's something that's very different, something I haven't read a lot of before and that was really cool. But I liked all of the gods and I liked the way that they manifested and it was really cool. It does, it reminds me very much of Percy Jackson. It just didn't have the same depth as Percy Jackson. Then I read The Girl, The Cat and The Navigator by Matilda Woods. This was also published in 2018 by Scholastic and I gave this one four out of five stars. Matilda Woods is an Australian author and this sort of felt like it took place in the north in you know a tiny fishing village and it is about Una who is around 10 years old in this story and she is born to a family who don't really appreciate her. A psychic predicted that she would be born a boy and so her father pinned all his hopes on that. He's not a particularly nice man and when she was born a girl the I think she's the eighth girl or something like that in the family. He really cracked it. And basically she was treated as persona non grata for all of her life, but she really adores her father. She wants to make him proud. And he is the captain of a fishing vessel and she really wants to travel with him. However, he is about to send her mother and all of his daughters away to the South to be married off because he wants more money. And so Una decides to stow away on his ship which causes all sorts of problems. It is really about Una finding her place in the world and knowing that just because he's her, that 
uh, her father is her father doesn't mean that he is always going to do the right thing and that there are perhaps other people who can fill that role of a father figure in a really well-rounded way. And also the cat in this is awesome because cats are good luck on ships and basically this cat thinks that he owns the ship and he can sail it, which is awesome. So I really enjoyed this. This was really fun. It was a really quick read. Just a gorgeous story of coming of age. And then I read The Secret Runners of New York. This is a 2019 release from Pan Mac and I gave it... Okay. This one is also controversial, a bit like Middle Game. I gave it, I'm gonna sit around a three, but I'm gonna talk about why. This is by Matthew Riley. For those of you who have not heard me talk about Matthew Riley on my channel, I adore Matthew Riley's books. I will admit that a lot of what I have is nostalgic attachment, and I am not an objective person when it comes to Matthew Riley books, because when I was a teen and I was really struggling to read, Matthew Riley's books were what got me back into reading. The Secret Runners of New York is set in the upper east and west side of Manhattan with the elite and wealthy students of a very prestigious boarding school. Sky Rogers is new to this school and she is trying to find her place within this school and encounters all sorts of bitchiness and typical high school drama. And that's where my first problem comes in because this is, has been classified as YA by the publishers, but I don't necessarily agree that it should have been. It's problematic because of the relationships between the teenage girls. So the teenage girls are very, very bitchy to one another. And yes, I understand that that is a reality. And as someone who went to a private girls school, I totally get it. And you know, that's fine. But I don't think it should necessarily be represented because it's very stereotypical, written by a male who is not a teenage girl. And that causes problems because we shouldn't be promoting that behavior. That said, the rest of the storyline, if you completely remove the teenage social dramas aside, is a really cool concept in that these kids have the ability to travel through a version of their New York in the future. So it's been promoted as Gossip Girl meets Mad Max. It was more Gossip Girl than Mad Max, but the times when they do travel into the future and they start exploring this world and finding out what's happening is really fascinating. And had this been written with adult protagonists, I don't think I would have had the same issues with it because I don't think the problematic elements would have been as huge a factor. So I am, I'm torn because I love Matthew Riley and I did enjoy this book, but I didn't enjoy the stereotypical way that the teenage girls treated each other. I just thought that was really, really poor. But in typical Matthew Riley fashion, you can't trust that anyone will survive. You can't really trust how things are going to turn out. And I enjoyed the concept of it. So take that as what you will. And believe me, this review really hurts me because I was so excited for this book. So let's really quickly talk about some stats. I can't remember the order I did this last time, so I'm just going to go with it. So with my age group reading, even though I have been reading a significant amount of middle grade, this has gone up, but I have still read 50% adult books this year. Young adult and kids are my smallest sort of age group reading this year. I have increased my female authors this month, I'm pretty sure, because it was quite male heavy with all of the sci-fi books I read in January, but I think I finally swung it back into being slightly more female heavy. And my protagonist gender tends to be fairly equal anyway. So male, female ensemble casts. And there are a couple of stories, particularly picture books, where gender is not really quite specified. So it's irrelevant. I have mostly read trade paperback books and I have mostly read books that are novel length. In that page count, 300 to 399 tends to be the, about the average page range still. Those numbers should shift slightly in April because I am planning on participating in Tome Topple for at least a couple of books. So that should shift some of that, those numbers up a little bit. My genre wheel is looking a lot more colorful. Science fiction is still the largest chunk, but that has significantly decreased since January. On average, I tend to rate things around four stars. That is possibly not objective of me, but it also because it's also because I know how to pick the books that I like to read. So I don't tend to have a lot of books on my shelf that are not books that I'm not interested in. And if I've got an interest in it, chances are it's going to be rated higher anyway, unless it's really bad. Most of the books that I have read have been published in the 2000s, 2018 being the highest one because I am reading through my back catalogue of 2018 releases, but I'm pretty sure the 2019 releases numbers have gone up. This month I'm throwing in an extra 
stats sort of display. And that is my publisher and I'm only throwing it in here because it's really colourful and really pretty because there's 50 million publishers that I'm reading from apparently. But it does look really um, cool. Obviously Alan and Unwin is probably my biggest chunk because I do have quite a strong partnership with them and I, they do send me books every month which I am very very grateful for. So those are the books that I read this week in the comments. Let me know if you have read any of these books or if you are planning on reading them and what your thoughts are on the books. I hope that wherever you are in the world you're having a wonderful day and I'll catch you guys in my next video. Thanks so much for watching. Bye guys.